Join me for a conversation with novelist Howard Andrew Jones. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. Hey guys, if you don't know who I am by now, my name is Matt Davids. I write the books of random tables. You can find them on drive through RPG, Amazon.com or my own website, DiceGeeks.com. My books help you cut down your GM prep time so you can have more fun at the table. I also have a book called The Great Book of Random Tables. I have taken 120 fantasy random tables, everything from items in a dungeon room to food at the inn to items in a troll's cave to encounters along the road to encounters in the city. Everything you need to help you run a successful session or a campaign without pulling your hair out. Like I said, you can find those Amazon.com, DriveThroughRPG.com, DiceGeeks.com. Just search for The Book of Random Tables or The Great Book of Random Tables. You will find it. All right. Now that that is out of the way, I have an incredible interview. Here it is. My guest today is a novelist as well as a longtime role player, Howard Andrew Jones. Howard, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be back. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, thank you for coming back again. Uh, you were on kind of way back in episode 14, and uh, we have uh, come a long way since then. So thank you so much for coming back on the show. Well, it's a pleasure. I enjoyed our first talk, and I look forward to maybe seeing you in person again this year around our content. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Um, and so since you've already been on the show, I won't ask you kind of about your history as a writer or as a role player, because we already did that in episode 14. Um, and so this time, you know, we, I really want to dive into uh, some of the things that you're working on and talk about uh, writing and, and maybe how some of that relates to role playing games uh, here and there. Um, but you're involved in a project called Tales from the Magician's Skull. Could you tell us what that is? Sure. It is a uh, twice yearly magazine put out by Goodman Games. Uh, Goodman Games, of course, is the creator of Dungeon Crawl Classics, but that really has nothing to do with the stories, except that uh, Joseph wanted to put a magazine together that celebrated sort of appendix in style fiction, meaning uh, fiction that was in the tradition of the stuff that inspired the creation of uh, fantasy role playing. And so Twice yearly, I assemble as many awesome stories as I can get my hands on, and um, uh, I edit them, and they go into Tales from the Magician's Skull, and it goes out to everyone who wants them. And issue six is in layout right now, and we managed to get the rights to uh, uh, have one of our writers write all new stories of Fawford and the Grey Master of Lankmar fame. Oh, wow. We're just, we're just really thrilled about that, and that'll start happening come issue six. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, that you were able to get the rights for that. That's fantastic. It is, and we have the exact right author for it, the uh, talented Nathan Long, who you may know if you've read any Warhammer fiction. Uh, just an incredibly gifted guy with just the right tone. Uh, I'm, okay. I couldn't be more pleased to have him doing the writing for us. Oh, well, that sounds fantastic. Well, now you you said um, you know that it was kind of a... Uh, you know, kind of a showcase for fiction that inspired fantasy uh, role playing and that uh, what kind of fiction, how would you describe the fiction in uh, Tales from the Magician's Skull? Oh, there's uh, there's no bones about it. No pun intended. It is a <laughs> sword and sorcery magazine. It even says so on the masthead. Mm -hmm. OK, OK. And could you describe sword and sorcery uh, for somebody who may not be exactly familiar what that is? Sure. You know, it's easier to understand the difference when you describe it as far as writing as opposed to fiction, because when you look at 
Conan on the screen versus, uh, say, Lord of the Rings on the screen, you're going to see a whole lot of the similar things with uh, guys leaping into action with swords. But if you read the prose style, if you read Tolkien, it is much slower. It is more of a leisurely pace. It takes a while to get things going. It uh, comes out of the old tradition where you sit down with a book and a pipe and you read for a while. Whereas Sword and Sorcery, pretty much the creation of Robert E. Howard, although you could say it dates back to mythology, the modern creator, Robert E. Howard, he was writing for the magazines. And when you're writing for the magazines in the 20s and 30s, you wanted someone to look at the magazine, flip to your story, and be hooked by the first paragraph. So these stories go, go, go. They hook you from the start and keep on moving. So that's one, that's one part of the difference between, say, uh, the prose style of epic fantasy and sword and sorcery. I, I could, how much detail do you want me to go into? Oh, uh, as much as you would like. <laughs> I like could sound a little professorial about it. But, you know, I have to lay down these guidelines so people see where the things are. I don't want uh, a whole bunch of stories that sound um, derivative. I don't want, when I get submissions to the skull, I don't want to see a whole bunch of stories about uh, elves that sound just like Tolkien elves or dwarves that sound just like dwarves from uh, any kind of 5e campaign, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if someone's going to use these creatures, I want them to do something new and different. And that's another aspect is that the people who were writing before all these genre conventions, before, before there were monster manuals and everything was set in stone, uh, this guy might have a completely different concept of what, what this is. This woman over here might come up with a completely different idea for how to portray dwarves, whatever. Or, you know, as frequently as the case, say, Robert e. Howard doesn't even use dwarves and elves. Mm -hmm. uh, really, I, I take it down to four things. Uh, the environment. Sword and sorcery fiction takes place in lands different from our own, where technology is relatively primitive, so that protagonists overcome their martial obstacles face to face. Magic works, but it's not this happy, glad Harry Potter magic. It's dark and treacherous and uh, inconsistent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the environment. The second, uh, protagonists. These are heroes that live by their cunning or brawn, frequently both strangers or outcasts, rebels improving, excuse me, imposing their own justice on the wilds or the strange decadent, civil, decadent civilizations which they encountered. They're usually commoners or barbarians. Should they hail from the higher ranks of society, they are discredited, disinherited, or come from the lower ranks of nobility, the lowest of the high. In other words, these are kind of like the wandering samurai or lone gunslingers. Um, these people come into the story. Uh, they're not fledglings destined for greatness. These are seasoned people. Um, and one of their obstacles, they are not... Um, Usually they're not on some kind of destined quest. Instead, they're besting fantastic dangers, monstrous horrors, dark sorcery to earn riches, treasure, the love of dazzling members, uh, you know, dazzling sexual partners, or just the right to live another day. And then lastly, as far as structure, sword and sorcery is usually crafted with a traditional structure. Stream of consciousness, slice of life, or any sort of experimental narrative effects are very rare. Um, so they have, you know, your standard beginning, middle and end, problem, solution, climax and resolution. Uh, it moves at a headlong pace. It overflows with action and thrilling adventure has to have surprises and characters who act rather than wait to be acted upon. Characters should fascinate. See, I pro I've slipped into my professorial mode there. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> No, no, no. That's good. I think um, I think sometimes you know terms like sword and sorcery or you know or other types of fiction you know gets kind of thrown around and and sometimes we forget that they're you know that that they can be confusing or that uh, you know we you know that some people may just not have heard of some of those you know. Uh, you know, genres or types of fiction just kind of talked and, you know, or spoken about in that way. Well, so it's, I, gotten, it's gotten kind of muddied. Uh, honestly, the term was coined by Fritz Leiber himself, the guy who created the Lankmar stories. Mm -hmm. And he coined it to differentiate the kind of fiction he wrote and the kind of fiction Robert e. Howard had written and uh, Seal Moore and some of those other earlier folks involved in the birth of the genre to distinguish that from sort of the Tolkien style fantasy, the epic fantasy. Um, and unfortunately, it's kind of gotten muddied because uh, I've seen a number of reviews for when Lord of the Rings first came out and then The Hobbit came out. Reviewers will describe it as a sword and sorcery movie because it's got swords and it's got sorcery. <laughs> yeah. So maybe what we need is a, is a new term to describe the difference. But again, like I said, when, we first, when I first started rambling about this, <laughs> the chief difference is far more noticeable 
on the page rather than on, on the screen. And I think so many people take in um, fantasy fiction now on, excuse me, fantasy stories on the screen rather than on the page. Uh, it can be harder to explain the term. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, and that's understandable because I think, you know, especially years ago, I, you know, when I, uh, when when I was a lot younger and I was really starting to read a lot of stories, I was confused by the terms as well. But then, once you once you read some Robert E. Howard and you put it next to Tolkien, you start to see the the difference quite starkly. So I think you're right. You you see it on the page pretty clearly. Yeah. Um, and now you mentioned uh, Fritz Lieber. Are, are there any other examples? What would be, you know, and we talked about Robert E. Howard a little bit. Are there any other examples of kind of some of the, the, the you know, that of authors who wrote sword and sorcery fantasy? You mean the, uh, the foundational writers or? Yeah. Want, yeah. Yeah. So then you've got uh, Seal Moore who created uh, Jarell Joyry uh, and that's Catherine Lucille Moore. So she's a grandmother of, uh, of the fantasy fiction, just like uh, Robert Howard's a grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so Fritz Leiber, Robert e. Howard, uh, Jack Vance often gets mentioned, although his dying earth is very different in feel from some of these others. Um, he was uh, very influential on um, Dungeons and Dragons. When you read the dying earth stories, you'll see that uh, uh, there's all sorts of weird sorcery and things that sound an awful lot like uh, Ian, uh, what, uh, what, Ion Stones, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, weird magics. But his Kujal the Clever is is uh, a terrifying individual. He's not a nice man. So after you've read these sort of heroic stories and then you go and read stories about Kujal the Clever, he's a swindler, a con man, a murderer. Or a, uh, just a, <laughs> be prepared for what you walk into. The stories are darkly amusing, but it's it's very different in feel. And mm -hmm. so then you've got, um, of course, Elric of Melnum and A, and so much writing of um, uh, Michael Moorcock, but of course that comes just a little bit later. Uh, but he had a tremendous influence on the genre too. Uh, you have uh, Lee Brackett, but she's more of a sword and planet uh, type vibe and space opera. But yeah. she was uh, her flavor of uh, fiction is incredibly important as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've I've read quite a bit of Lee Brackett's. Uh, oh, have you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Eric John Stark. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. She was also the co-writer of The Empire Strikes Back, which I'm sure some people have heard about. <laughs> Absolutely, she was writing. She was writing characters like Han Solo and uh, Malcolm Reynolds, uh, thirty years before those characters ever appeared. Yeah, you know, those were the kinds of people she wrote about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Some of her stuff is is fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, you know, thank you for kind of going into that and 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 sharing that because uh, you know, if the people are out here listening, they can pick up some of those titles and uh, you know, if they haven't experienced some of uh that sword and sorcery, uh they can uh look let up me, some of those authors. Yeah. Let me mention one that I think is really important. He's a little bit more recent and unfortunately he recently passed. Oh. And that is Charles Saunders, the creator of Amaro. Uh, uh, Saunders was an incredibly gifted writer, and he uh, left us too soon. And unfortunately, he didn't get enough appreciation while he was alive. A lot of that was uh, through the fault of a whole variety of publishing errors. But his mm -hmm. tales of Amaro, if you look up Amaro, I-M-A-R-O, uh, a character wandering through a fantastical version of Africa. Wow. Uh, Amaro was one of my very favorite characters uh and you could say that um saunders sort of founded the sword and soul movement although he didn't know it at the time uh which is uh, i guess you'd call it black sword and sorcery mm -hmm. he wanted to write about a uh, black hero in a uh, fantastical africa and so he did and he cast a large shadow and now other people are following in his footsteps oh oh that sounds amazing I well, hadn't really heard of him before. Oh, he's one of my very favorite of uh, all the sword and sorcery writers, and I wish more people knew about him. I yeah, we, we've dedicated issue six to him, actually. Okay. Because he, well, like I said, he so recently passed. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely going to look him up because that sounds really good. It sounds really good. Now, you you did mention something in there, you know, um, about like the heroes and the in the characters and and i did look up the submission guidelines for uh the tales from the magician skull and 
I, I was interested to see that one part and you mentioned it. You said characters who act rather than characters who are like reacting. Uh, why is that important for a story? Well, when you're looking at a short story, keep in mind, it has to be short. We're going to get seven or eight, um, seven or eight stories in an issue. Each one of them is going to be about uh, between six and 10,000 words. So you're probably only getting uh, in layman's terms, 20, tw- be about 20 pages in a paperback book. You don't have a whole lot of time for people to sit around pondering. Uh, they need to get up and go. Uh, we don't want them to sit around waiting to act upon or whining. We want characters who have reasons for what they do and they go and do it. That's not to say that uh, the characters aren't presented with situations that they have to stop and think about. They do sometimes. But we, I tell you, I, for one, get tired of reading stories about people who whine all the time and constantly emote. I just wanted to get on with doing something interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, having over the years taking a lot of, say, you know, creative writing courses and um, hanging around a lot of people who write um, and probably committing the sin myself, of which I won't mention. But um, why, why do some writers want to stay in somebody's head and listen to somebody whine for a while? Why do you think we want to do that sometimes? I, God knows. <laughs> <laughs> it, drives, it drives me crazy. It, it tends to be, uh, oh, look. I'm probably going to get blacklisted from somewhere saying this, but Hunger Games drives me nuts. <laughs> not, not the movies. I, I enjoyed most of the movies, but uh, I, I barely got through the first book. And yeah. Katniss is so much more interesting on screen because you don't have to listen to her whining her way through the text. Uh, it, I don't know if it's like a modern thing where we do so much navel gazing and constantly have to reevaluate our emotions. But um, I tell you, uh, a few years ago, I started reading old hardwell detective stories and westerns from the 50s and 60s. And those people do not pad their narrative. Uh, it just gets right going. If there's some sort of weird backstory with their character, they don't front load it at the front of the story. It kind of slowly unspools rather than growing. Oh, I guess I got to endure the backstory for five, the, uh, you know, for five chapters before the story really starts. No, the story freaking starts. And then they skillfully interweave the backstory. So by the time you get to hear the details that you've been wondering about, you actually want to hear them as opposed to like suffering through them. And uh, I really, I would really like to see more modern fiction of all stripes do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And, (laughs) and I know I'll probably get blacklisted too, but I had the a similar experience with the Hunger Games. I I gave up around like chapter twenty or twenty two. Like I couldn't even finish the first book. Um, uh, I just always find it interesting because, um, you know, when I was in college, I studied screenwriting, and then, um, uh, you know, I I write obviously now, but. certain books can get away with things that people say not to do. And I, I'm just always interested with that because like, I see things that say like, you know, on publishers websites, they'll say, don't have your uh, main character wake up from sleeping, you know, on the first page. Well, that happens in the hunger games, <laughs> you know, uh, don't have your character be whiny. Well, hunger games, <laughs> you, know, <kind> of <laughs> um, you know, so I, I'm just always kind of just interested, you know, you know, or just seeing how some of those, uh, uh, you know, things that we shouldn't do are, are done in books that become really popular. So <laughs> I think some of the whining comes from the, uh, so there's a whole lot of writing uh, instruction that takes place in college and creative writing courses. Um, and I think it's, I think a lot of it is too focused on, you can only write what you've personally experienced, which is why we get so many stories of grad students, uh, uh, stories about grad students in writing courses. I mean, no. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's full of self-examination and and it's, it's, I don't know. Gosh. No, I, I agree. And I, I think that is true because um, it would it would have been about 20, 25 years ago when I was in college. I do remember picking up uh, the literary kind of magazine from the college and I opened it and there was a story and I still remember this. It was just like the first sentence was, you know, um, 
something like the 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 thoughts you know were jumbled in my mind as i sat in the coffee house and i like closed the literary magazine and like put it back down i was like oh not not interested <laughs> well there's a school of uh, there's a school of fiction that believes that uh, only fiction that is um feels very real is of interest yeah it, it is of a value yeah and i used to take a uh, great umbrage of that but you know different people like different things in their fiction and, I, and i'm fine with that as long as there's still room for me to do mine sure so i'm a lot less bitter about that than i used to be yeah. i think that school's wrong but some people feel very strongly about that you yeah know, want to read about coffee houses and and uh boring nebbishy people um in their literary fiction let them do that i want i want action and adventure most of the time yeah yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah, if that's if that's your cup of tea, hey, go for it. Um, but as long as as long as we can get uh, you know a two handed sword some, somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, uh, but yeah, I just kind of find that interesting. And, and two, like I said, I was looking at you know your submission guidelines there for the Tales from the Magician Skull, and I saw a couple of other things um, that I wanted to kind of bring out. Um, and the, I thought it was kind of interesting. It said no dwarves or elf detectives. Do you get a lot of elf and dwarf detective stories? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not remotely sort of sorcery. Keep in mind, right? Yes, sure. I used to, um, I used to edit for Blackgate magazine when it was a magazine before it was just a website and I would get in elf and dwarf detective stories wow. and it was they're always full of their own cleverness and and um, delighted with their way that they could take a trope and turn it into a fantasy trope. And and I, I just had no patience for it. It's hard enough to find good sword and sorcery fiction, let alone in a magazine that's for sword and sorcery. And so I think um, I think the joke I made on the submissions page was uh, any any elf and dwarf detective stories will be immolated <laughs> because uh, I just don't ever want to read them anymore. There's probably some brilliant ones out there, but I'm, I really don't want to see them and I certainly don't want to make room for them in my magazine. Okay. Now that's, I just thought that was interesting <laughs> when I saw that on there and I was just wondering how many, um, uh, you know, got submitted or whatever, but I can certainly <laughs> see that. Yes. Well, they're not. Sort I, of I sort haven't of. seen any of this when we, op- we, just opened for submissions the first time after issue five for about uh, two months. And I wanted to make sure I didn't get any because a lot of people, they'll see that we're open for submissions and they will just blow past the guidelines. Even though I think I wrote some really clear guidelines, I got some stuff in there that didn't remotely match the guidelines, but apparently whoever was writing dwarf and elf detective stories must've noticed because I didn't get any. Okay. And I was delighted. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, that's good. And then you mentioned Blackgate. I think we mentioned it the last time I, uh, in the early two thousands, I submitted a number of short stories to Blackgate and they were all rejected because I was terrible. I, I was just terrible and I don't know what I was doing. So I'm sorry if I subjected you to anything, but I, d- I did not write a, an elf detective story. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, I retroactively thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I probably did some other horrible sin that you just, uh, you know, that or if it was you, know, you at I, the time, just I passed over. lots of terrible stuff. Uh, <laughs> you got to write a lot of terrible stuff before you get the hang of it. And God knows, maybe I still am. I'm sure some people would tell you. <laughs> tell you so. Yeah, yeah, we're 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 all we're all trying. <laughs> we're all yeah, trying. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just no coffee houses or anything. <laughs> Um, but also, you know, I did see, you know, obviously role-playing game podcast. Um, I, I talk about that a lot. You're a longtime role player. I did see on the submission guidelines, it said no RPG campaign write-ups. And, um, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, because, you know, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. Sometimes we have just as role players, we just have the coolest campaign. It is just so cool. And, you know, most game masters, I would say, certainly most want to be writers at some level. (laughs) Um, A lot of the players do as well, because we're all drawn to creativity. Um, 
why shouldn't we just write up our our you know our 5e campaign and send it to magician skull or another magazine i tell you why you can cannibalize your great ideas you can cannibalize a couple of characters and you can send them to us but mm -hmm. uh keep in mind again the length if we're looking at 20 or 30 pages that's an awful short amount of time to have uh six say characters introduced and have us care about them that's mm. a, that's an awful small amount of pages to have that many characters and have us care about them. that's the first problem the second problem is that so many campaign worlds are incredibly derivative mm -hmm. and one of the things we want in our magazine is to have stuff that doesn't feel bog standard doesn't feel like it's from a generic fantasy world uh the other thing i don't want to read about uh, a, a thief and a fighter and a paladin and a druid and and someone meeting in a tavern <laughs> it just feels so uh, standard. So if you're going to, if you have a really cool campaign concept, uh, you know, take it and make it so it doesn't feel like it came from someone's game table. Turn it into something else. Uh, God knows I have run all sorts of ideas out uh, through my game table. Uh, I've stolen characters. Uh, that I've seen at my game table and pop them into some of my fiction. I've stolen villains and villains plots, but I don't think any of my fiction with the possible exception of uh, the first two Pathfinder novels feel like, and, and this is deliberate since it was Pathfinder feel like uh, a game table. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it feels, hopefully it would feel more like uh, a traditional story. And that's what we want. It is not uh, uh Stories based on your role playing table monthly. That's not the name of the magazine. Okay. Okay. And then uh, would starting in the tavern be kind of the equivalent to starting in the coffee shop? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. I mean, let's face it, that's a really generic way to start your campaign anyway. I mean, it can work, but it's not the memorable way that your character is going to be, that your players are going to be talking about for years later. Remember how it started in the tavern? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you're a genius and you can make it really memorable, but yeah, no, please don't do that. Yeah. You now I'm sure someone could do it brilliantly, but uh, yeah. yeah, I'd rather not. Yeah. I'd rather not constantly be the judge of that. You know, if I get 20 stories uh, now where each one of them starts in the tavern, I'm going to be groaning. <laughs> Yeah, because it's it's really execution based, right? It's Absolutely. it it would have to be a phenomenal starting in a tavern, right? It would just have to be phenomenal uh, because we see it so much. And I, I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, you know, uh, starting a campaign, maybe when I was, you know, 14 or 16, I'd started in a tavern, but, you know, I soon realized after that, that it's just like, that's boring, you know, start it sure. somewhere else. Well, um, you know what? If it's the first time you've run, it's the first time they've played, they'll be thrilled to start in a tavern. Exactly. Right? But if you start every campaign in a tavern, yeah. 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 No, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah, so that's, I guess that would be a tip off if, if it comes in and it's, uh, you're starting in a tavern, that it would be a role playing game session. There's, there's a lot of tip offs, but yeah. 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 What, what are some other ones? Obviously, you said like, you know, classes, some classes. standard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, um, if someone's down a hallway and they're in a dungeon and they're talking to the dwarf, the dwarf said like, okay, that's a, that's a big uh, alarm signal flaring right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, that's pretty much what you would find in a, in a campaign. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And now you did tell, you know, on the, on the submission page, you know, kind of one last thing here. Um, uh, you did say, and this confused me for a long time. And like I said, you know, I studied screenwriting in college and um, I, I, you know, uh, went back and forth a long time with writing and struggling with it. You mentioned like, you know, don't tell us how cool the characters are. Show us how cool the characters are. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, a lot of times you're reading fiction, um, especially at the journeyman level or beginner level. And the character is described as being super cool, but then they don't really do anything. Mm -hmm. Instead, you need to show the character in action and movement being competent and being clever. Rather than everyone standing around talking about, oh, he's so clever. Uh, oh, is this the famous clever uh, Snorgon of Deluria? You know, oh, yes, I hear a great tale of Snorgon and his great strength. 
you know, just show us Snorgon being strong and clever. Don't have people standing around talking about it. Yeah. No, and of course that makes sense. And um, it's more uh, interesting too, unless yeah. you're, I mean, there's, there's other ways to do it, but again, we're talking about, um, we're talking about this style of fiction. And it has to grab you from the start and get you moving. We don't want to hear about how cool your character is. We want to get to know your character through what the character does. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rather than having him standing around thinking about it or her standing around thinking about it or other people talking about how cool she is. Let's just have her be cool. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think it's always right. It's always better to, to have the, uh, the, the moon glint off the blade of the sword than just to say the moon is shining in the sky, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, the more you can accomplish with, if you can get your descriptions and your sentences to do more than one thing at a time, then, well, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And sadly, it's taking me like 40 or more years to learn some of this stuff. <laughs> I feel like the slowest learner in the world. You just have to be stubborn and steady and keep at it. It's like any skill. Um, some people are going to be born with a little bit more of it than others, and some are going to be born with a better ear. But if you just keep hammering it, if you really want to do it, and believe me, I wouldn't. Uh, you get. I'm segueing too much. <laughs> no, that's all right. You'll get better if you try, and you just have to keep working at it, and you got to want it. And I wouldn't wish. I wouldn't wish it on someone if they didn't want to do it because it takes a lot of effort and time. And honestly, there's very few rewards. So if you're in it for fame or fortune, uh, go do something else. Um, if you are in love with the art of storytelling, then maybe some fortune will come your way. Fame's still unlikely. But yeah. do it if you're in love with telling the story and want to get better at it, not if you want to claim don't uh, don't be in it to write it until oh the story is good enough now I'll be famous. It has to be that you're in love with the process of writing and storytelling. Otherwise, you're going to be in a world of disappointment. Yeah, I I think that's fantastic advice because I I don't know. I mean we you know we hear some of these stories. You know we hear say like. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, Andy Weir from who wrote the Martian and we hear him signing, you know, seven figure movie deals and stuff like this. And, and for some reason people don't, you know, they think about the lottery ticket kind of idea instead of thinking about that perhaps he's been writing and like, you know, for like 30 years or more, you know, struggling to get better and better each time. And that doesn't, that doesn't usually fit the, you know, kind of the nice uh, little dream story. All I have to do is write a book and I can become rich and famous. <laughs> yeah, it's not like that. So I was writing short stories and various novels for decades. I finally landed, I, you know, I don't know how many books I wrote before I finally got a book deal. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, from St. Martin's Press. Um, gosh, I was in my, uh, I think I was in my late 30s, early 40s when I finally got that book deal. And I must have written eight or nine books. And it's, it's hard to remember the exact number because sometimes it was the book so completely revised that it might as well have been a different book. Uh, and God knows how many short stories were rejected. You just have to keep reading other people's work and taking apart and figuring out how it works and trying to figure out how to make yourself better. And I think you have to experience a little bit of life before you can write about humans <laughs> <laughs> um, and life and dangers to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I think that's some, some more excellent advice right there that, um, that, uh, the part about, you know, reading, reading something and taking it apart, seeing as how it works. I always, you know, try to ask questions, you know, it's like, why does this scene come now? Why did the writer put this here? You know, um, I do it with movies and TV shows as well. It's just like, why is this showing up now? Why is this here? What were they trying to accomplish by doing this? And just try to ask myself about questions whenever, you know, those questions when I'm reading so I can see, you know, what they're trying to do, what the structure looks like, what, you know, or even then break down sentences, um, to see why they were using some of these words, you know, what were they, what were they trying to show me? What were they trying to That's communicate? Crucial. That's crucial. You have to think about what you're imbibing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. 
I, I applaud that. You have to constantly be thinking about story. You can learn from both successes and failures. Yeah. Sometimes you can say, oh, I can see what they were trying to do with the scene and why it's there, but it didn't work. Some of the things that are most painful is when you see a, a really good episode of a show and you realize that they missed the mark and you'd be like, oh, if only they had done this, uh, there wouldn't have been a problem. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's simple fixes, like uh, maybe a, a different line of dialogue, then there wouldn't be a hole in the plot. But you got to constantly be constantly be looking at your favorite things and taking them apart and figuring out why they work if you're going to get better yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, I think that's something that I try to communicate, you know, cause we can, we can just, you know, passively consume, you know, we can just, you know, flip on a movie and, and watch it or watch a TV show or, you know, read a novel or something and just not really think about it too much. But um, if we're really trying to get better um, at the craft of writing, it's just like, you know, you, you've got to break it down. You've got to see why they're putting things there, why they're, you know, using these sentences. And, and then we, you know, uh, we got to get to a place to where we can see that in our own work, right? Read a scene and say, I, this, this doesn't work, even though I wrote it, and, you know, it's like, I don't, it doesn't work, but. Um, yeah, you got to be brutal and honest with your own work. Yeah. That's what I said. It's got to, you can't be about your ego. It's got to be about the story. The story has to be even, even if you're in love with your own creation, you have to view the story as separate from yourself so that you can see it objectively and be willing to change it or cut it or even uh, realize, oh, my God, this is exactly like a Twilight episode episode I haven't seen for 12 years. I forgot about it. Yeah. And then be willing to throw it over your shoulder and write the next one. Yeah. And, you know, like I mentioned on the podcast, sometimes that I studied screenwriting and it was just like I, I think I wrote uh, complete. I think I wrote 11 complete screenplays uh the first 10 were garbage like you know the first like four were like unreadable by like another human being other than myself right <laughs> like they were they were awful the the 11th one i was kind of like eh, not bad but it's it's it still wasn't you know it still wasn't to the level of because i was reading I was reading a lot of screenplays and, you know, you, you read the best in the world. Right. And you're like, well, I'm nowhere near that, but you, you know, you can read some other ones and say, okay, I at least improved. I at least got my structure. I've gotten, you know, I figured out how to tell a base, you know, a basic story, but I'm just missing, you know, something, you know um, you know, and I still had a lot of, of way to go, but I was, I was hungry. So I had to, I had to get a real job at some point. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, that it was, that was a big step for me realizing because, uh, you know, being able to look at somebody else's writing and say, okay, that's really good. And then looking at my own writing and say, okay, this is bad for these reasons. Right. And that was a big step um, uh, that, that I think that I took and I'm, I'm still struggling at it, of course. Um you know, we were, you know, you know, I'm here talking to you who, you know, who are way more advanced than I am. And of course, uh, you have a series of novels and you have a new one that is going to be coming out uh, fairly soon. Isn't that right? That's correct. It's, uh, it's been done for a while now, but because publishing moves slow, it's not going to be available until August. And that's the third book of my um, uh, Ring Sworn trilogy coming out through St. Martin, starting with For the Killing of Kings. And the third book is called When the Goddess Wakes. Okay. All right. Could you, could you tell us a little about it? Sure. Well, as you could probably guess, um, I try to grab the reader right from the start, and there's not a whole lot of whining in it or uh, <laughs> people sitting around on their hands. Uh, it starts with the mystery, and then um, pretty much once that gets underway, um, I try not to slow down very much. It is – I describe it as sort of a cross between, like, the uh, – the Three Musketeers and the Chronicles of Amber. And if you haven't read the Chronicles of Amber, that may not help you. So um, then let me say it is laced with intrigue and weird world building. It's about a sort of uh, an elite core of warriors uh, who discover a dark secret about their kingdom. And as two of the people flee trying to solve the answer, they are framed for murder. And so they're pursued by their own friends 
Uh, and just as that is beginning to happen, all hell's breaking loose because the kingdom is getting ready to be invaded by an ancient enemy. And things just spiral out of control from there because there's mysteries within mysteries and um, secrets within secrets and uh, allies who may be enemies, enemies who may be uh, allies in the end. Uh, I had an awful lot of fun writing it, and I hope that people have an awful lot of fun reading it. Okay. No, it sounds really cool. So you don't start in a tavern then? I do not start in a tavern. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, it sounds really cool. And so, um, and so I know the last time we talked, you were the, I believe the second book had just come out. So this is, uh, uh, this is really exciting that the third one is coming out. Does the, does the series end with the third book or is there more? It does. No, it does. I uh, could write a, a prequel series and, uh, you know, there may be a few survivors by the third book. So I'll just, uh, I don't want to give anything away. But uh, you no, know, everything is wrapped up. I wanted to write something that was contained. I know people get irritated with super long series that don't get finished, and I wanted to write one that that uh, finished. So, pow, there you go. In like two and a half years, you got three books, um, and uh, pretty much the second one starts only a few moments after the first one ends, and the third one starts maybe a few moments after the second one ends. So, uh, there you go. Okay, nice. Nice. No, it's it sounds uh, it sounds really really interesting, and um, um, and uh, I'm I'm sure you know I will I will certainly place links to your novels in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com, um, and also uh, you know as we're we're coming here down towards the end, unless there's something else you want to mention about the the novel really quickly, um, you know. Where can uh, people find the Tales from the Magician's Skull? Well, it's available through Amazon, of course, but you can also find it at the Goodman Games uh, web store, which will also allow you to uh, subscribe to it. So just search for Goodman Games, Tales from the Magician's Skull. Um, some of the earlier issues now, since it is a magazine, some of the earlier issues are sold out except in PDF form. But the most recent issues are still available in print. And you can subscribe. And that way, um, once you subscribe, you get an issue every few months. And I tell you, as many great stories as we got uh, during our submissions period, we may start coming out more than twice a year. I don't know yet, but uh, we're still talking about that. We just have a lot of great fiction. And at the, at the rate we're coming out right now, it may take a couple of years for it all to get out amongst the people. And I'm Joseph, I love the new stories so much that uh, we may want to get into people's hands sooner. We're, we're trying to figure that part out. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, and I'm sorry, I thought of a follow-up question to that. Just about how many submissions do you get each time? Well, um, keep in mind, so the first two issues, we just ran to see if we would enjoy working together and if we would have fun with it. And the answer was yes. Okay. And then um, for issues three and four, and five were kind of like, well, now let's get used to the process. So in those cases, I sent out uh, invitations to people that I had known for a long time who wrote Sword and Sorcery. Not just anyone, but keep in mind, I was in the trenches for a long time on the other side of the desk submitting places. And I met a lot of writer friends who also love Sword and Sorcery. So most of the writers in the first four or five issues are either people I knew or people Joseph knew or people who knew people that Joseph I knew who all love the same stuff. We didn't open up for submissions until uh, February 22nd of this year for the first time. So that was the first time uh, submissions were wide open to anyone as long as they weren't writing a dwarf and elf detective story. <laughs> so we were open for about uh, two and a half months and my God, we got, uh, I'd say we got over 600 submissions all told. Maybe it was 560. I, I don't remember the exact number. It's a little inexact, honestly, because some of them were coming in from uh, existing contributors and I didn't log them in the same way as I uh, logged in stuff that was coming in from uh, people that I didn't know. Wow. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> it, it was. And uh, fortunately we had some interns, some of whom, uh, lost their lives in the process. They read stories. Man was not meant to, you know, <laughs> their minds. Uh, Hopefully no deaths were actually recorded. <laughs> no, no. Well, there wasn't anything left, just dark ash. We couldn't even mummify him. Which was a <laughs> practice. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, um, 
like I said, uh, certainly um, in the early 2000s, I subjected many, many editors to things that they probably wanted to tear their eyes out after uh, looking at. So um, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, I feel for people and I, I apologize to all the editors out there. <laughs> They they won't remember. So much stuff comes through. It's, yeah, it's it's hard to keep it all straight. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, you know. Um, also, Howard, uh, why don't you let people know where they can find more of your novels and learn more about you? Well, certainly, I have a website that uh, I only maintain now every um, every month or so, but it has links to all of my works and it's really easy. If you remember my name, Howard Andrew Jones, the website is howardandrewjones.com. And uh, I think the opening page links to all of my published novels so far, including uh, the newest one, which you can pre-order. And again, the newest ones when the goddess wakes, but the first book of the trilogy is for the killing of Kings. That's available through St. Martin's and it should be available uh, through most of uh, local bookstores and if it's not your local bookstore can order it and it's always available through amazon and um, uh, various other uh, online venues okay and i will be sure to put a link to your website and to your books and to the tales from the magician skull in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com well howard it was a pleasure speaking with you again having you back on the show was was just fantastic so uh thank you so much It was a blast. Thanks for having me. All right. There you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Howard today. Howard brought truth, didn't he? He really gave some important writing advice today. So anybody out there who wants to be a writer, who is writing, I hope you took a lot of his advice to heart and also how that advice could be applied to your GMing or to your role playing Um, Just a wealth of knowledge uh, from Howard today. Please check out the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com so you can find links to Howard's books. Howard writes incredible fantasy novels. Also, there will be links to Tales from the Magician's Skull so you can read some amazing sword and sorcery fiction. Please check those out again at DiceGeeks.com in the show notes for this episode. All right, guys, if you want some free stuff, head over to DiceGeeks.com slash free. You'll get 10 free dungeon maps. You'll never miss an episode of this show. And each and every Friday, you'll get an email update from me letting you know what is going on in the world of Dice Geeks. If you like this podcast, guys, I know I do this at the end of the show all the time. But if you like this show, please consider rating liking, subscribing, or leaving a review uh, wherever you're listening, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you know, whatever pod player or app that you like. Those things help the show immensely, and I would really appreciate it if you would do one of those things. Also, if you would like to support the show financially, you can do that at patreon.com slash dicegeeks. Every patron that I get just lets me know that I should keep making this show. So I really appreciate my current patrons. I would love it if you would even just consider becoming a patron. It is my privilege to come to you every Wednesday with an awesome, exciting, fantastic guest. And I thank you so much for listening today. So until next Wednesday, keep gaming.